Welcome everybody to our uh, City Commission meeting of November 2nd. We appreciate you all being here today. Um, we'll call this meeting to order. And I just want to remind everybody that we are celebrating Commissioner Tornga's birthday today. Oh, Not now, I don't know if it's actually today, but this week we're, we're celebrating and we will have cake after the meeting. So happy birthday, right. Commissioner Tornga. Um, and if you'll join me, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So, uh, first on our agenda is the is presentations, and we have a presentation, um, a proclamation for Drive Electric Tampa Bay. I will turn that over to Vice Mayor Gal. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Drive Electric Tampa Bay, Natalie Gass, would you please come forward to receive this proclamation? Whereas the National Drive Electric Program has been developed to educate citizens about the benefits of plug-in electric vehicles, and whereas the City of Dunedin is dedicated to being the statewide model for environmental sustainability stewardship and to protect and improve our natural resources for the enjoyment of all, and whereas the City of Dunedin is dedicated to being a leader in the use of clean energy, increasing charging station infrastructure, and establishing policies and programs that conserve energy and promote sustainability, and whereas petroleum-fueled vehicles are responsible for over 50% of our local greenhouse gas emissions and are a contributing factor to the air pollution and climate change threatening the health of our citizens and the sustainability of our planet, and whereas the transportation sector is moving forward clean energy technology that reduces our independence on fossil fuels and supports a healthy environment and economy. And whereas the City of Dunedin has partnered with neighboring, neighboring municipalities in North Pinellas County to establish the Drive Electric Tampa Bay event, which will be hosted in Oldsmar on Saturday, November 13th, 2021. That's downtown Oldsmar on Saturday, November 13th, 2021. Now, therefore, I, Jeff Gow, by the virtue of the authority invested in me by the mayor of the City of Dunedin, and on behalf of the entire City Commission, do hereby proclaim November 2021 as Drive Electric Tampa Bay in the City of Dunedin and call upon all residents of the city and throughout Tampa Bay to join me in supporting the aims and goals of this, <clears throat> of this worthwhile effort. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, and City Manager. Mm -hmm. Natalie Gass, Sustainability Program Coordinator for the City. I am so excited November has been dedicated to Drive Electric Tampa Bay. It is my honor to be partnering with the cities of Oldsmar, Safety Harbor, Tarpon Springs to bring this event to you, which will be held in Oldsmar this year. Um, we're really grateful for this partnership and to have regional collaboration on Drive Electric Tampa Bay, as well as many of the other initiatives that we have at hand. Um, <clears throat> the city of Dunedin has 10 charging stations throughout the city for electric vehicles to plug in, and the city currently has four electric vehicles within its fleet, and we hope to gain more um, as admin vehicles come up for replacement. Since 2014, this annual Tampa Bay event has been promoting the benefits of electric trans transportation options. And for licensed drivers interested in test driving, we will have a ride and drive at the event. We will also have a car show with people showing off their electric vehicles and sustainable vendors. There's gonna be food trucks and family friendly games for all ages. So we're really excited for everyone to come out and join us. And we thank you for helping us charge into the future. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Quick question before we give her the round of applause she deserves. Um, I get asked a lot about golf cart charging stations and I think the electric vehicle versus the golf cart are two different things, right? They're two different things. Yes. And we do have 
a few, right? We have a station at the public library, Dunedin Public Library. And don't we have one in, at the garage? Okay. That's what I was going to say. I thought we at the we garage. Have one at the garage as well. Okay. So we should <laughs> probably put that out there. Um, but are they expensive? I don't that they're not prohibitively expensive, no. I mean, I think it, I, I just get asked about it a lot, and mm -hmm. you see how many golf carts we have, and it would be great if we could get some more, whatever that would take. So I just throw that out there at yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Okay, now I would like to invite uh, Les Tyler, our finance director, and Ashley Kimpton, our budget manager, forward. And we're so excited about all your hard work. I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Uh, good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. The Government Finance Officers Association uh, is pleased to announce that the city of Dunedin, Florida, has, been, uh, has received the GFOA's Distinguished Budget Presentation Award uh, for our current fiscal year budget. The GFOA is a group of about 2,800 professionals, uh, and it spans all governmental entities and even some private firms. They recognize an, uh, achievement and excellence in government as far as uh, the budgeting process goes. The uh, Government Finance Officers Association advances excellence in government finance by providing best practices, professional development, resources, and practical research for more than 2,100 members, actually, across the nation. An independent panel then reviews the budgets of, of those 2,800 entities and advances those that, that uh, are awarded this di Distinguished Budget Award. And I just want to read to you a little bit of, of uh, some of the uh, narrative on the Budget Award. Presents uh, the Government Finance Officers Association in the United States of America and Canada. It presents the Certificate of Recognition for Budget Preparation to the City of Dunedin. Uh, Florida. This certificate of recognition for the budget preparation is presented by the Government Finance Officers Association to those individuals who have been instrumental in their government unit achieving a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. The Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, which is the highest award in government budgeting, is presented to those uh, units whose budgets are judged to adhere to program standards. So I want to congratulate our finance department, our, our budgeting division, for the hard work and uh, through actually uh, the pandemic, uh, the last two years have been very difficult uh, for for our, our budget division, and they have excelled. Our, our budget is, of course, balanced. Um, the reserve is good, and uh, we, have a, we have a good year ahead of us. So I want to con congratulate Les and Ashley for all the time that they put into their budget. Uh, and this is actually, I think, the 13th year in a row, 13th year in a row that we have won this award. So I'm very proud of the mayor. Thank you. As are we. If you will come up forward, I'd love to present this to you. It's heavy. <laughs> this is what it looks like. Here, I'll come down there. Uh, I'm Les Tyler, the finance director, and I'm here with Ashley, our budget manager, as you all know. I just want to mention one thing real quick uh, that I want to mention that one of the things they look at is our financial policies and procedures, and I want to commend the commission and the city manager for setting those policies and procedures because we do have, I think, solid ones that's been affirmed by our rating agencies as well, so I want to, I want to mention that. And also, I want to thank all the departments because uh, it's a 400-page document, I think, right, or something like that, and, and it, it's a team effort. So I want to thank everybody for all their hard work on the budget. Thank you. Ashley, you want to say anything? Yeah, just really quick. I also wanted to give a shout-out to accounting. Ross Adair, Scott Caterson, um, uh, Tanya Burnett, she was with us, and also Tammy Richardson. She helped a lot as well, so just our finance team. Thank you. Well, don't go anywhere. Because I'm, I'm sure the commission has a lot to say about this too, because we've experienced your process. But I'll, I'll just go ahead and also read something that was written um, on the press release, which is 
Um, you know, the award represents a significant achievement by, by you all. It reflects the commitment of this body and staff to meeting the highest principles of government budgeting. It includes a policy document, a financial plan, an operation guide, and a communication device. Um, and it's so true, I think our residents don't realize that our budget is our communication device um, of you know how their tax dollars are being spent, but all the different things that we're gonna work on through the year. Um, you all have had to do um, an enormous amount of projecting in the last couple of years, you know, with no real rule book on how to pro project during during a pandemic. So we, we thank you for your hard work. Vice Mayor. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, basically, just to echo your comments, you know, especially the last few years that you guys really have had to figure things out that hadn't been figured out before and how to get things done and under what conditions and not knowing and, and all of that. So just thank you very much for your effort. It's, it's quite impressive. Thank you. Commissioner. Yeah, so <clears throat> I always have to say this. I've been through the good, the bad, and the ugly of finance yeah. directors being a former staff person. So um, you guys are the A team. And I say that in terms of your skill set, but even more importantly, your credibility. And that has shown itself so many times in this room, but uh, particularly with finance board. Um, and uh, it just, it makes our job so much easier. I mean, obviously we have lots of budget challenges ahead, but to have such a credible, hardworking, good team makes all the difference. Thank you. Commissioner. Yes, um, you know, I've been through the good, bad, and the ugly mm -hmm. also. You know, um, it was like, well, I don't understand this. Well, Deborah, you're not supposed to. I'm going, what? <laughs> Even I know I'm supposed to understand it. Um, so I really thank you all. I like your transparency. I think you really do try to make it so people understand it because it is a huge living document. Also, I think you've been displaced during the pandemic, and that's made it harder for all of our employees that are displaced while we're waiting on our beautiful new city hall. So all congratulations. It's a wonderful achievement, and thank you. Commissioner. So I'll just say what everyone else said is great, and thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I really am happy that you're there. Thank you. We really do appreciate all of your efforts, and, and please know that they're seen. Um, it's very visible, and, and I think the word you just heard was transparency. I think those are really important and credible. You couldn't ask for more out of people who are working with all the numbers. So thank you very much. Yeah, I think we're going We'll uh, go on to citizen input. Now is the time for anyone to come forward and speak to any item that is not already on the agenda. Okay, I don't see anyone. Thank you. Move on to consent agenda, which is the approval of minutes from August 31st and September 23rd. Uh, board and committee appointments, arts and culture, board of adjustment and appeal. Board of Finance, Committee on Environmental Quality, Historic Preservation, Local Planning Agency, and Marina Advisory, as well as an interlocal agreement between Pinellas County um, and uh, DEP for uh, regulatory program and surveillance fees. Um, any items to be pulled? All right, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Commissioner Kynes and Commissioner Franey. Thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes <clears throat> unanimously. Thank you. And we'll move to action items. And first on our agenda is the proposed three-year collective bargaining agreement between the City of Dunedin and IAOF Local 2327 effective October 1st, 2021. This is Resolution 21-28. Nikki, would you please read that by title only? 
Yes, Mayor. Resolution number 21-28, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Dunedin, Florida, providing for ratification of the 2021 to 2024 collective bargaining agreement between the City and the International Association of Firefighters, Dunedin Firefighters Local number 2327, for the bargaining unit consisting of the City's firefighters and lieutenants authorizing the city manager to sign the collective bargaining agreement on behalf of the city, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date. And this has been reading of resolution 2128 by title only. Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, Vice Mayor Gale and Commissioner Twanga. Thank you. Um, Teresa. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Commission, Teresa Smalling, Director of <laughs> HR and Risk Management for the city. Uh, it is my pleasure to bring before you a three-year contract, which was negotiated between the Dunedin Firefighters Local 2327 and the city. Um, I am very pleased because this took uh, all of two meetings mm -hmm. with the union and two executive sessions with the commission. Before I go into the details of the changes, I just want to go ahead and thank uh, both teams. Um, on the city side, our lead negotiator was Brett Schneider of Wise Sirota and <clears throat> Healthman, and uh, was also our EMS chief, Mark Zepetto, and our deputy chief and fire marshal, Michael Handoga, and our director of finance, Les Tyler. And also on the city side, those that work behind the scenes, of course, Jennifer, our city manager, um, Ross Adair, budgeted man, our accounting manager, sorry, and Terry uh, Kearns, our HR and risk <coughs> manager. On the, on the union side, I want to thank uh, President George Trubig, uh, Vice President Lou Staggs, uh, Secretary and Treasurer Chad Dennison, and uh, Rich Pauley, who was the uh, business agent and lead negotiator for the union. Uh, just to go over the, um, the changes to the contract, um, there is a market adjustment of 8% that the all bargaining unit members will receive. Uh, when we looked at our salaries in comparison to the, our market, our neighboring cities, we realized that there was a, a, a shortfall and the city made the um, the, the conscious decision to go ahead and make that adjustment for this upcoming contract. Uh, the union will also receive uh, cost of living increases of 2% in the ensuing years, year, year two and year three, and uh, as well as the step plan, increases in the step plan on the union members' anniversary. Um, there is also an article um, that the, the city put forth that was accepted working out of classification, uh, that there will now be uh, nine uh, county certified paramedics who will be designated as field training officers and will receive a $1,200 stipend each year um, that will help the department with uh, training new firefighters coming into the department. Uh, uniforms, there were just some uh, language changes to represent what is already the practice in the department. Uh, duty time exchange, uh, lieutenants will exchange, may now exchange shifts with acting lieutenants and other lieutenants. Um, so as to help with the amount of people who are able to make swaps because there are only 11 lieutenants. Um, so sometimes that makes it hard to do swaps in the unit. Uh, at this time, I'd like to take any questions that you may have. Anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Um, anyone wish to come forward from the public to speak to this item? Anybody from the fire union? Welcome, George. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? Vice Mayor, Commission. Just real quick, uh, thanks for the speedy um, clear, uh, on this contract. Um, I think uh, it's a win-win for both sides. Hopefully we can curb some of the uh, uh, losses that we had over the years due to um, not having competitive salaries to other departments. So thanks. Thank you, George. Anybody else? 
Okay. Um, come back to the city commission. Um, maker of the motion, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody. I, I, I thought it was a, a, a great show of collaboration between both sides. I think it was a just decision and I uh, look forward to moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Twanga. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate all the work that was spent on this by, on both sides. And, uh, and I'm really, really pleased with the fact that I think we have a competitive um, situation here for, for our first responders who uh, we are all very proud of. And uh, so I hope that this sets us forward. Um, we are competitive uh, in the marketplace here. For those who don't know, we do have to compete against uh, the other municipalities for personnel, et cetera. And uh, we, have a, we have a wonderful department, and now we're very competitive, I believe. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kynes? Yes, I think you could just say this in a little slogan. Um, I mean, we were all here to stop the loss, stop the loss of uh, really good people because of non-competitive salaries. So uh, I think we all worked well together, um, and uh, this was well needed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, to me, it's uh, as a former HR professional, um, it's about the market. And I think um, this is, uh, I'm proud of this commission. This doesn't come without some <laughs> fears of the challenges of our budget as we move forward. It was, a, it's a, it was an expensive step to make, but it's a commitment. It's a commitment to all of you sitting out there as firefighters and lieutenants and paramedics uh, to the value you are to this community. Um, I've seen some of the good people we've lost uh, because we're not competing and we need to compete. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, it was time we had to step up. And uh, I thank you for your side of the aisle and thank this commission for the same thing. But uh, this is the right move, and um, I'm glad we're doing it. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I think we approached it a little differently this year. Um, especially given what we've been through in the last two years. But, you know, we watched, we have watched sort of the, the loss um, of folks, but also the difficulty in hiring. And that's, that's been a problem because we're not as competitive as others. And interestingly enough, there are, there are local agencies around us that have their own millage that can afford to pay certain things that we haven't been able to do. Um, and I think we all determined that we couldn't worry about that piece of it, that we just needed to be competitive with what was local around us. Um, and that was important to us. It was important to us, not only for our firefighters, but it's going to be important for us for all our employees um, this coming year when we do their study. Um, so I think this is just a first step. We appreciate all of um, the efforts that you all have put forth on your daily jobs in general, but especially in the last two years, and I think we really wanted to show that appreciation. So we're very happy about this contract and, and hope that you are too. All right. Uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Franey? Aye. Commissioner Kynes? Aye. Commissioner Tornga? Aye. Vice Mayor Gao? Aye. Mayor Bajowski? Aye, and that motion passes unanimously. So now we're going to do a, a signing, right? Yes. Okay. I am. I'll follow you. Your drum roll. Is there a camera? We need a camera. Is there Dunedin Brewery beer right after the <laughs> <laughs> It's a little early. I know, Eddie, you're right, it is. I thought George would think of that, though. George, I thought you'd think of the Dunedin Brewery, even if it's early. <laughs> or Lou.
like to read it first? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she is. Creative. than that, I hope. <laughs> yeah. For good reasons. I was just going to say, maybe not. Well, good reasons. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we'll move on to item 3B, which is the review and approval of the at-a-glance calendar displaying all of our dates. Um, Jennifer and I have reviewed it and found a, a few conflicts with some holidays. Um, so uh, we're just asking to postpone this so that she can review it with her team and kind of determine a, um, a recommendation uh, from them because if you've got a Monday holiday and a Tuesday meeting and, and people are going to be out of town on a Friday, it's problematic. So. They kind of want to take a look at it and, and make a recommendation for us. You know, and I also didn't say usually we, we try to give August, you know, some significant time in August. And, yes. and everybody knows that that is their time. Right. And there was nothing. It was just, you know, every month was. Well, and I, and I think um, Rebecca, and this we'll talk about this, I think, when we come back and look at this. But I think what Rebecca has done is not made the assumption. Right. I understand. But I, but I do think. We do have some kind of history on certain things, and we should probably just I've call it a day. Yeah, I just had a comment. Is that if sure. Deborah was done? No, same thing. I talked to um, city manager yesterday about the whole Monday holiday, Tuesday meeting yeah. thing, because we don't even have all our meetings are on Mondays. Yeah. So, you know, to right. the staffing, which means we meet on Friday, which means it's the agenda's not even done. Right. And, and I was looking back this year. We only had that. There was only one time that right. happens. Right, but we have this a This year bunch. it's twice uh, mm -hmm. that it happens, but there may be some other conflict. Right, and, and, and so in I'm March, glad you guys are on top In March, of we have a meeting on St. Patty's Day. Uh -oh. oh, yeah. That's and we have a meeting on Mardi Gras. So, oh, <laughs> sorry, yeah. not happening. You know, it's like, okay. Well, so there's just some things there. and We'd all be parked. Yeah. But she's got to review this stuff with everybody and just so we'd have our, see what the team can handle. So the other issue is we're asking for a couple of weeks. We may need a, a little bit longer, and I know that you want to have the calendar as soon as possible, but we need to solidify that trip to Toronto yeah. this year as well. Okay. We're looking yeah. at June, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this would just give them some time to try to make sure we have a pretty solid calendar. And yeah. You, again, I mean, I think, you know, if we sort of know when it's better, you know, it is yeah. a better time to be able to get away, that's so much better than us not right. being here because we don't want to miss. Right. I think we all agree we want that first meeting in August gone, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But. Yeah, okay. I think that's been true for years. Yeah. yeah, it has. We started doing it, I don't know. Five, six, seven well, years ago. I don't remember, but it's been a while. It's been quite a while. Right. And we'll ask for direction when we come back to you to to uh, always take that first yeah. meeting off and always have it off the calendar. But but as you said, Mayor Rebecca needs the direction from the commission. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so we have to postpone it. Would you like to do you have a date? Let's, we have to let's, do a date certain. No, there's no advertisement for this one, so you don't need to. Um, I'll just say postpone until... I think we can get it done in a couple of weeks. I do. Rebecca and I can sit down and talk. We'll talk to the directors. So and we, can, we can put on one of the December meetings. Well, no. But we can put it one on the December one of the December meetings, maybe. Yeah, that's fine. Maybe the first meeting in December. So you want to postpone it to date certain? Yeah. I mean, the, otherwise it's going to have to be a, a supplement. So yeah. start item. Do you want me to make a motion to sure. postpone to date certain uh, the first meeting in December? Yes. 
work session. Yep. Okay. Is there a second? Yes. Which is actually November, November 30th. 30th. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. okay. I just want to make November, sure everybody. November, November, November 30th. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah the, the, All right. I stand correct. Oh, we're going to get him in before <laughs> December. Right? All right. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. And then the temporary valet parking license agreement, staff's recommending to um, postpone this until the 16th work session. Jennifer has assured me that there's no issue with the concept. It's just getting all the documents in order. Yes. So is there a motion to postpone that to November 16th? So moved. moved. Second. Okay. Third. Commissioner Kynes they and Commissioner Franey. They should have it. Right. All right. They should what? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. This is between the church and the yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, we have a bid for the Armor Drive and Magnum Drive water main replacement. Russell, welcome. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, Russell Ferlita, uh, Assistant Public Works Utilities Director and City Engineer. Uh, and next to me, I have Matt Woodham, our senior engineer. Welcome. Um, and he's on the next agenda item, so he came up with me. Uh, so here we have bid item number 21-1189. It's the Armor and Mangrum Drive water main replacement. Um, funds for this project were budgeted in fiscal year 22 um, out of the water and sewer fund and the stormwater fund. Some basic background on the project. It's in the Fairway Estate subdivision. Uh, specifically, it's on Armor Drive, on Mangrum Drive between Fairway Drive and Hagen Avenue, uh, Davies Avenue, and Webb Avenue. This project will replace old aged cast iron pipe with brand new PVC pipe, as well as adding eight inch under drain uh, along Mangrum Drive and the north 300 feet of Armor Drive. It's approximately 3,100 feet of PVC pipe, as well as about 1,500 feet of under drain, along with all appurtenances. This will increase the reliability of the city's uh, potable water distribution system. That will reduce the risk of leakage and water main breaks. Um, the underdrain system will also increase the life uh, of the associated roadway. The notice to proceed for this project is planned for the, the month of December and to be complete uh, around April or May. Um, we, but I want to rest assured we're not going to be digging up on Christmas Eve, so <laughs> just so you know. Um, Staff hereby recommends approval of award of this project to MTM Contractors of Pinellas Park, Florida in the amount of $756,990.80. So with that, I'm here to answer any questions. So you're not going to start construction until after Christmas, right? Correct. We need to issue the notice to proceed so they can start getting materials. Um, we gave them, I believe, um, five months or six months for this project. I have to look at the contract. Um, you know, especially now with the crazy prices of, of materials, PVC being one of them, we want them to lock in their prices uh, and get things ordered um, so that way we can we can really hit the ground running. Okay. But I will not let them dig up people's driveways on Christmas Eve. Okay. Questions? Uh, yeah, Smear. Um, how long do you anticipate the actual construction? Um, it really depends on, on how quickly they can move, but typically they'll be done in about two to three months. Um, with a full force. So this includes all ordering, all approval of materials, is everything. So. Any questions? No questions. Questions? Uh -uh. Um, you're going to do an extensive campaign to notify the residents on we've already, the street? Yes, we've already actually reached out to the Fairway Estates HOA, notified them this project's coming, gave them a quick blurb, gave them the map on where the projects will be affecting. Uh, and then also notifying them that they're going to get an increased water quality because the, the cast iron will no longer be there. And hopefully we'll fix the issue we have with the roadway where we're getting groundwater seeping up uh, at the low areas there. But you'll, you'll notify those folks also? Yes. Okay. Because, you know, sometimes somebody will not hear from their HOA. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll do door hangers, things like that as well. That's part of the contract. Okay. And is, is the road going to get torn up at all? Uh, sections of the road will be, yes. And, and will we be repaving? Um, that's actually part of this next year's paving contract, so yes. Ne I'm sorry, say that again? It's part of next year's paving contract to repave those roads. So what we're going to do is patch the area according to our city standards uh, in order to have the asphalt done immediately after, and then after that, the paving contractor will come through and completely repave that, those roads. Well, I appreciate that, but we're going to disturb those 
streets twice by not doing it right after. Right. I mean, what we're doing is we're going to increase, we're going to basically restore what we had there, right? So if we were to do, we're going to try to put them as close together as we can. The paving contract actually coming up to be advertised. It's advertised right now. It should be awarded. We can try to schedule them right after each other. But they're diff two different contractors as no, well. No, I, I get it. I just, you know, for the benefit of the residents that live along those streets, that's, you know, when you have that kind of thing going on, it's disruptive. It would just be helpful, I think, to them if we were, whatever we're going to do, if we try to do it back to back right at once so they're not being disturbed. It's better for them to be disturbed a little bit longer than twice. Mayor, I don't think that we can commit to that today, but we will, we hear you and we will do our best. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, anyone wish to give public input on this? Okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve this contract? So moved. Second. Commissioner Kynes and Commissioner Franey, any final contract uh, comments? Contract. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. Any? Uh, yeah, my first girlfriend grew up on Magnum, and so I reached out to her, and she's very happy. <laughs> uh, although she hasn't lived here in decades. <laughs> very happy. You were just looking for an excuse. I'm just saying your wife is not happy <laughs> now, however, that you publicly said you reached out to her. Anybody else? Any final comments? <clears throat> all right. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, now we have the bid for the annual sanitary sewer cured in place pipe lining contract. Russell. So I already introduced myself, so I won't do that again. And um, this one was actually uh, designed and bid by our senior engineer, Matthew Woodham. Uh, it's bid number 21 1190. It's the annual sanitary sewer cured in place uh, pipe lining contract. Uh, staff recommends a motion to approve award of the contract to in situ form uh, technologies LLC out of Chesterfield, Missouri, in the amount of $980,242.04. Um, as you know, the city of Dunedin owns and operates its own wastewater collection system. Uh, in, order, in an effort to protect and preserve the city's collection system, prevent sanitary sewer overflows, and protect the natural environment, uh, we have enacted an annual sanitary sewer lining program. Um, it extends the useful life of the pipes by 50 years or more. Uh, it reduces the operational burden to the lift stations as well as reducing I&I, &I, which in turn then reduces the loading to the city's wastewater treatment plant. Um, in our effort to optimize our process, we've identified lift station basin number 32 in the Greenbrier subdivision as a good candidate for lining to focus most of our efforts. Um, the notice to proceed for this project is planned for the month of November and is expected to be complete in May of 2022. Staff hereby recommends approval of award of this work to in situ form technologies of Chesterfield, Missouri in the amount of $980,242.04. So with that, we're here to answer any questions. Okay, any questions for Russell? Mm -hmm. Russell, how many, how many projects do you have in uh, on the schedule sheet to actually do and how far out do you go? So we have a, a planning period of about five years where we, we, we line up a lot of the projects. We work um, closely with finance to try to make sure that we balance what our budget is for the upcoming, um, I guess you would call that a semi-decade, so the next five years or so. Uh, and the reason we do that is, is we, we can't front load all of our projects at one time. We just don't have the staff. So without going and hiring consultants extensively, which we still do need to hire consultants for specialties, um, we, we do it that way. We also have limited resources in construction management and inspection services as well. So with a lot of the large projects that have been coming through, I know that they've been very taxed. So, so we balance both budget and staff time. How many projects are there? I'd say off the top of my head without looking, somewhere around 10 to 15, somewhere in there. And how often do they get changed in the sequence? Um, every year we look at where they're projected, and every year at least a couple of them move. And has this one moved? 
This particular project, this is an annual project, so we do it every year. So we haven't done it the past year, so this one, what we did is we actually combined two fiscal year budgets into one, uh, and we did that because of how timing was with the turnover we had in engineering in order to be able to get to this project. Um, and also, we, we noticed when we started getting to it that we realized we could probably get a little bit better prices by doing the two years, so we waited a little bit and just advertised both together for this particular project. How many other are annual? We have the annual manhole lining project as well, which is different than the sewer uh, pipeline lining. Uh, we also have an annual lift station rehab that, that has a finite um, schedule to it, whereas the, the pipe and the manholes are indefinite at this point. We have so many pipes and so many manholes that we have to line that for my foreseeable future here, and probably my entire career, we'll be doing those projects. I was gonna say, how many manholes do we have here? Off the top of my head, I can't recall, maybe you, yeah, it's in the thousands. We also have in the tens of thousands of, of pipeline. Actually, Matt, you want to go ahead and you know where the numbers are. <laughs> you um, this up for you. Thank you. Uh, grand total for the total length of pipe within the city is over 700,000 feet. Um, the total manholes, I would have to pull up uh, my spreadsheet on which I'm very dependent, and I'm sorry I don't have those numbers. Uh, but each one of them has to be lined in sequence with the piping. Otherwise, you're, you're running into the scenario that uh, he described with the paving, where you want to get the infrastructure done before the paving goes down so you don't come back and disturb the new, the new work. So I do not have the exact numbers on the manholes, but I can get them for you. Or he says 3,000, right? Somewhere around there. I ask these questions because when I was talking to the city manager for the, for the review of this, um, obviously, we go through a full process and we come up with and we're taking the lowest bid at this point in time with people that have done work for us before. And this is just really an important part of our city, an important part of the quality of life. Um, and it's unseen. It's a manhole. Nobody knows how many we have or where they are. They go down underneath there. And if, if they fail, not good. Well, we've seen consequences of failure in the city during your tenure here. Um, we had a failure on Milwaukee where the line started to collapse, and you saw that took about a month in order to repair. We had actually very expensive once it it's failed. extremely expensive. So the approximate cost of that project, and I, I apologize, but off the top of my head, it was somewhere around the ballpark of three hundred thousand uh, dollars. If we catch those lines a lot earlier, and we we do our best with, we have our own inspection crews, we have our smoke testing crews. Um, but it's somewhere around a tenth that to repair it before. So that's why we make such an effort to get this done. And the same with manholes. I don't know if you recall on the corner of Bell Trees and uh, was it Patricia? About five years ago, we had a failure of a manhole there. And that project cost us around $200,000 to replace that manhole. It was a very deep manhole. We had to replace some of the pipeline at the time. Um, and then on top of that, when we came across a failing uh, stormwater line at the same time which is not included in that $200,000 mark. But we repaired that. So the, the point of that, of me going on that, a little bit of a rant there, is, is the fact that we, we make a, a very strong effort to do the preventative maintenance and inspection. And even as, as good of a job that I believe our crews do, some things slip through. And that shows you the difference of cost of repair versus maintenance. So our heroes are our infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you for that information and just giving a rough idea of how many, of how many projects we actually have and how many, how many manholes we have and, and what really happens here. It's, it's a complicated and, and big project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, okay. Uh, anybody from the public wish to come forward? All right, seeing hearing, or hearing none, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Commissioner Kynes and Commissioner Tornga, any final comments? Um, I would just like to say if everybody up here hasn't seen the process for in situ form, it is really interesting. I mean, I thought it was very interesting just to see how it works. Go out one day when they're doing it. Yeah, I mean, if you're interested, we can notify you when they mobilize, and you're welcome to go out. The, the nice thing about the technology is it's relatively uninvasive. Um, I mean, you do have to set up trucks with heaters and chemical mixers, things like that, but you're not tearing the road up, uh, and it's only down for a, a specified number of hours, not days. So it, it's a nice process. 
Yeah. And I think that, if I may also make a comment, I think that's a great idea. I've, I've, I think everyone here has seen it. Okay. But I would love to go back out again, um, just, just to show the support and, and just to watch the process once. Yeah, we could also send you a video, but um, we'll make a note to, to notify you. I'll, I'll, I'll notify Paul, and, and we'll get it through Jennifer to you to let you know when we're mobilizing approximately where, and you're welcome to come out anytime. Just make sure you wear a good PPE, like a vest or something, so you don't. And th thank you, Deputy City Manager, but, but I have seen it before, but it really is just more in support of, of what these guys do. They don't get to give us a brand new pool, but they give us a, an infrastructure that's really important. Yeah. Any other comments? I'd just say, hey, you know, it's a million dollars, and a lot of things that happen in this city, uh, like today, are a little, sorry, Russell, a little dull. Um, and they're not that sexy, but this is what really is the infrastructure and the important pieces of the city that uh, it may not be as exciting as the Halloween events, et cetera, it's, <laughs> but it's the most important thing we do. So but thank you. We have great staff behind this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and for anybody watching, I want to um, just kind of remind everybody of what happened in St. Pete five whatever years ago it was where they had you know, sewer running in the streets. And, you know, a lot of folks in the community asked us, well, what's our, what's the position of our, and the, and the condition of our infrastructure? And we took that very seriously. I think we were maybe budgeting $250,000 a year, something like that annually, which, you know, for something like this is really nothing. Um, we doubled that. Uh, investment annually to line our, our um, sewer pipes. Um, in this case, it's almost a million dollars and we're covering an entire neighborhood. Um, uh, now, it is Greenbrier and it is an unincorporated Pinellas County. Um, somehow we need to get Greenbrier to finally join Dunedin because I mean, I used to go to school with people that live, kids that lived in Greenbrier and they're still classified as Dunedin, but, um, you know, it's really great to be able to do this and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do this and protect our environment. So we, uh, my point is, is we're very committed, you know, to protecting our environment from some of the things that we've seen happen around us. And so I'm very proud of that. All right. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And then we have the proposed agenda for the November 16th work session. Um, don't think there's any changes there at this point, right, Jennifer? Actually, Mayor, I did get a request um, to move item 3B to the CRA agenda on December 16th. The... Uh, oh, the... The daycare thing? Well, don't we have to approve it, too? I'm sorry. Could you, which item was it? The parking lot. Preview the parking lot. Parking lease agreement. Um, I had an email from... Doesn't both bodies, don't both bodies have to approve it? Both the CRA and the commission. Yeah. Just yeah. The lease over Denise yesterday. I don't. I think it's just with the city. It's within the CRA. So let me just double check the terms of the lease. Okay. Well, all right. So we'll just we'll make a motion to approve, and if you to change it, you change it. You know. I'm pulling it up right now. Oh. You approve all the other lease agreements hmm? for parking. The city commission approves the other lease agreements for parking. I don't remember, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if both bodies didn't have to the approve. Right. You know. I'll, we, I'll double check. I mean, it, it also depends on who owns the, the I mean. Well, it's I'll, a CRA paying for it, so. Yeah, we can, um, I'm, like I said, I'm just pulling it up real quick. Um, so the other, why don't you, why don't you look at, why don't yeah. you, 
the, um, the parties are is it's just the city and and the trustees but why don't you take a look at what we've done with the other parking leases and let's just make sure we're consistent for transparency yeah. purposes and it's better to leave it on than take yeah it. so let's just leave it there and doesn't mean you can't add it to the CRA too mm -hmm. you know right true probably want to have it there for discussion purposes anyway um, but anyway Okay, so can I have a motion to a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, and Jennifer, you think 2C is actually going to be ready? <laughs> That's the Briar Circle? <clears throat> I'd like to, to keep pressure on the attorney and, and the property owner to get it done. So, yes, I'd like no, to say thank you. Oh, it's the, the reduction? <clears throat> I spoke with George um, yesterday, too, and they said they should have no issue bringing it back by that date. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Good, that's great. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Commissioner Franey and Commissioner Tornga, thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, one minute. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All righty. Now we'll move. We have no workshop items today. No. So uh, any commission discussion from anyone? Um, this is things that I'd like to bring up that we haven't discussed. Mm -hmm. Okay, two things, and I talked to, um, I did talk to Jennifer about this. And, you know, I've been very concerned, and I know, Teresa, that, um, you know, we've sort of had a twindemic uh, with, um, you know, with COVID and mental health. And I was just wondering how we could maybe get our resources out uh, actively to help our employees um, to sort of right themselves after a very difficult once-in-a-lifetime event um, of this one and a half years of the pandemic. I know we were having little let's talk things when we first started, and I thought those were wonderful. People really sort of said, you know, I just, I'm not feeling right. And I think it's almost, and I've really thought about this a lot, it's like I, I really hope we're coming down on the end of this pandemic, but now it's almost like it's a post-traumatic stress. Uh, it's like for a year and a half, you know, you, you've been under, everybody, everybody has been under tremendous pressure. And, and I also think with our employees, not only have they had that pandemic, twindemic pressure, they've also been displaced, you know, until we can get in our beautiful new building. So that was just, I was wondering, you know, if we could, you know, just let our employees know we certainly can direct them to resources. I know we have early, e the EAP, um, various resources, but um, that we're aware and that we hope that they'll reach out if they if they have um, if they're feeling any anxiety and stress. That's my first thing. Mm -hmm. Now the second thing, and this is for Nikki. And you know I have to do all these continuing legal education seminars. Mm -hmm. So I saw one that was so fascinating, and it was from the Earth Law Center. And it's very new environmental law, and, and it, it basically espouses a, a very cutting edge concept that the earth has standing. In the past, only corporations or individuals had standing, uh, not rivers, estuaries. And some of the biggest cases are now happening in South America, and they did involve rivers and waterways. But the people that brought these suits were the people that were directly affected by the damage to uh, the river, water bodies, et cetera. And I just wondered, Nikki, um, I'm, I know you have environmental attorneys that with, with Bryant Oliver, uh, Bryant Olive Miller, I mean, because it's such a huge group. We actually don't have an environmental practice group. You don't. But I do know some attorneys who practice substantially in that area. I was just wondering, uh, because it is such very new cutting edge law, that if there was any application for uh, municipalities, I was just really fascinated with the whole idea that 
the earth in itself has standing now. I've, I've, never, I've never heard that. I'm not aware of that as a concept applied in Florida law, but I can double check that for the commission and report back whether or not natural resources have specific standing. It's actually been a bigger topic in Florida about whether pets have standing that I've heard about more recently. Mm -hmm. And that would be, that's obviously a, a jump from our um, British common law system, which we came from, um, not the coloniz same colonization of the international law that, I, but I'm not aware of the CLE. Um, I can go and I can, um, I can report back to the commission whether or not that's been applied in Florida, but I am not aware of any Florida court applying that a natural resource has standing to, to sue, um, nor how that would affect the, the, the city uh -huh. um, and, and also extending be, that they, yeah, to, they, yeah. to a municipality as having um, seen and and to sue who for what? Well, I mean, I guess I was almost, I guess I was almost thinking of some of our water bodies, like, and, and again, this may have no application and it may be such new law that it's not being followed in Florida yet. As I said, a lot of these were in South America, some of these big riverways but I just thought we have so many waterways and St. Joseph Sound and, you know, we've had problems with people dumping in St. Joseph Sound and, you know, I may be just totally off the, the Richter scale, but I thought it was fascinating. And I wondered if, if there's any kind of precedent in Florida for this kind of law. And that's my only question. Like I mentioned, I'm happy to look into it for the commission and report back, but I'm not aware of any Florida court applying that state, that state <clears throat> a legal standard to give standing to natural resources, but I can double check. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, anybody else have any commission discussion items? I do. Commissioner? This is a big one. Here we go. Been involved with this for many years, and that's called the trail. And the trail at Skinner. I was down there two weeks ago, again, walking the area, looking, seeing, nothing, is, nothing has really changed from the environment of, of, of what's happening. And, and nothing has changed, in my opinion, as I observe traffic that's heading east, particularly in the morning. And what happens is there's two lines of traffic, and we discussed, I made this point of, oh, maybe a month or two ago when we were talking about, about Skinner. And um, it is just incredibly difficult to judge when, when something's going to go wrong down there because there's a blockage of, of ability, a capacity for somebody to see perhaps somebody coming. And, well, we had it yesterday again. That's maybe 20 times in, in the last seven years that, that we've had something like this. So... Um, I'm not going to attempt to come up with a solution here unless somebody asks me what I think we should do. But we need, we need to most clearly, definitely put up some kind of a communication to parties that are, that are on the trail that are coming to Skinner to tell them that this is an extremely dangerous intersection as soon as possible. Um, it's, it's, um, it's going to happen again. And it will and it will continue to happen. And and in some cases, I, you know, I'm not sure that we really we could say, well, here's the here's the solution that it would never happen again, unless you literally put a traffic light up there, and then somebody can still run the traffic light. So let's warn, and make it really really visible for the people that are on that trail, to understand that they're coming to a dangerous, very dangerous intersection. I can go into detail about this. I've watched the eyes of the people. I've communicated this years ago. I know I've worked with the city manager a number of years ago and, and, and asked if we could put the sheriff's car down there. She did. Uh, that, that may not be the solution at all uh, to, to assist her, and nor may these signs. But at least we communicated to these people that just because they think a car is stopped, they can go. They better get ready for that car to have the potentiality of moving forward, particularly when they're in the left lane heading east. 
it's just in, in, in almost impossible to see things. You've, there's too many things happening there. So until we get that Skinner Boulevard worked out um, with, with the big guys, uh, safety for our residents or for anyone visiting our city is incredibly important. We've had problems. We just had it again. I have to say, stop. We have, we have to stop this. We have, if we have to put a barrier up there and make the people lift the barrier up to go across it, I know I was on Fulver Pinellas for four years. I was on the, the, um, the security task force for the trail for Fulver for, uh, Pinellas. Um, I, I know we've looked at this and talked about this and talked about this. Well, I'm continuing to talk about it, but I, I'd like to stop talking about it and at least do something more than what we're doing. I know it's problematic. I know it's difficult, but let's do it. Let's put something out there to tell these people that you are coming to an incredibly dangerous intersection. I don't know if that helps or not, but at least we did that part of it. We have new camera, do we have, I'm sorry, would you mind just communicating what sort of what we have down there right now? Mm -hmm. We do. We have, and they were recently installed, their, their motion detectors so that the lights start flashing yellow uh, when it detects the motion on the trail. And that was really to detect the bicycles moving through uh, and the pedestrians as well. And they are working, uh, if I may. Um, Commissioner, I did send you an email late yesterday. The mayor, uh, vice mayor and commissioners with the, the police report on the accident. I think that would alarm the commissioner and what alarm staff as well is that the pedestrian was in the crosswalk and the lights were flashing. The, uh, the young lady driving through the intersection did stop at the trail and then proceeded through the trail and hit the pedestrian. That's in the police report. That's very alarming because it appears that everybody was doing what they were supposed to be doing. I think and it's the sun. It was the sun, correct. And it's the same thing happens when you're heading west at sunset. Correct. Yep. Same yeah. absolute thing you cannot see. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Mayor, uh, you know, and, and Commissioner, I think staff is as alarmed as the commission is. So allow us, if, if we can, to reach out to those who are in control of that roadway to start talking about whatever we can do um, to, to address this situation. I got to tell you, in response to that, I, I sent that report off to WIT and kind of said the same thing. I've had enough. Mm -hmm. I, I think we absolutely have to insist to FDOT that we need to read something there. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen enough. Mm -hmm. I don't care what their thing says for all of the state, and it's gonna affect the design of Skinner, but I think people absolutely have to come to a damn stop there, period. I I, it's the only solution. We've tried every single other thing, and I appreciate the whole signage thing. I think that too, but I'm we, sorry, we, we just have to have a stop. You mean the red I have light done this flashing? for too long, so I'm not speculating. I've been down there. I spent hours. I have spent hours, or more than hours, but hours at a time down there. I used to, when well, I was a heavy duty motorcycle rider, for those of you who don't know this, but I used to tell people and I used to teach people to watch the eyes of the people in the vehicle. Watch their eyes. And if they don't see you, get ready. Get ready to either maneuver your bike out of the way or put it down. But watch their eyes. And I go down there and I watch their eyes. There's too much happening there. It's too much happening. Both coming, particularly heading east in the morning, particularly. And the visibility, what happens is, is the people think they can now go because the light is on. And these people, they thought they saw them. They don't see anybody. And they start off because somebody's blocking their view. This, this, there's two tragic occurrences here. One, the person who's hit, I hope they're okay. And then the person who was driving. It was totally unintentional. Um, let's at least tell the walkers right now. I, I, I know signs. I know it's an issue. Let's tell them right now. Right now, this is a dangerous intersection. We're not going to stop you. We're not going to pray for a light to come here. We're going to ask for the light to come here, but you don't need to know that right now. It's going to take a long time but let's put a sign up and tell them this is an incredibly dangerous crossway. Let's try to scare them. John, can I tack on just a minute? Um, you know, the, I, one of the things I, I was wondering, and I thought about this before this happened yesterday, was, um, I, I don't know, the, the motion detector seemed like a great idea, but 
whenever I go there now, it doesn't seem like a great idea because it seems like it gives a whole new false sense of security to people. And, you know, sometimes people aren't even going to cross. And the motion goes, and then they walk the other way. So it's one more way The you know, when you're stopping as a car, you're like, okay, like, is there somebody there? Is there not somebody there? And, and you're right. There's so much going on, you're blocked. So it's, it almost adds a whole other level of uncertainty. And so I'm almost curious as whether that's actually helped the number of incidences or hurt the number of incidents. Um, but, um, and I don't disagree with you, Mayor, but I don't want to say this absolutely has to happen. I think skinny and down of the road, less happening is going to make a big difference. But I also think the motion detector actually adds more uncertainty instead of less uncertainty. And it would be interesting to kind of see what the, what the thought process is. It's because on the pedestrian side, there ought to be stop, push, go past versus just this, oh, I don't have to worry because the motion detector is going to do it for me. And then the driver's got so much going on, they don't know, is there somebody there? Is there not somebody there? Can I go now? Except they weren't stopping and pushing. That was the problem. So this was the yeah, way to it. address it. I'd like to know what the numbers really are. Has it helped or has it hurt? Or I, I don't know the answer. Obviously, skinning it down is going to make a huge difference, I think. Except it's still going to be two lanes heading west and two lanes... One lane, maybe, heading east? Yeah, I, I, asked, I don't remember, but it's I still asked on the one lane heading to have only one lane heading east, to have two lanes heading east, this is going to just right. it's gonna continue. Be, I think it's one lane heading east, but it's two lanes heading west because you've got people taking a left and people taking a right. Yeah, that's true. So, well, and that's the problem it well, does. The two lanes heading west are going to happen after the trail. So coming up to the trail heading west. Right, but the one problem one is, is you're going to have that... If I remember correctly, you're going to have that roundabout, which I think is a problem there, and and you're going to be consistently moving, and then you're going to come to there, and those lights are going to flash. Then what are you going to do? The roundabout is is, is intentionally there to keep traffic moving, but we need people to stop, <laughs> you know. So I think it's going to fight each other. I think it's going to encourage people to keep moving. Mayor, what about With the skinny lane? You know, what about the raised crosswalk idea that they're now using? You know, that we went round and round about on Douglas, uh, on Douglas, bad. which is only Mayor. Two. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what the answers are, but I'm just saying I think we have to seriously look at something different because what's right. there is not working, and we have to re-examine maybe. We have to ensure that what we have there at the trail is, for the new plans, is really going to help if I, it. If I may, I brought this up for two reasons. Number one, fine, let's look at this. What do we do long term? Is it one lane coming? Is it raised cross? Is it a stoplight there or what? But right now, let's put us, I've watched the eyes of the people that are, not the cars, the people that are walking. And you watch the eyes of the people that are riding their bikes. They don't look anymore. They're done looking. They're done looking. Have you ever, have you ever watched a bullfight? Sorry to bring up a bullfight. You get ready, and if the thing starts to move, you you better start moving yourself. So, look, I'm not blaming anybody that got hurt there, and I'm not blaming anybody that got hit, but let's at least put a warning up for those people now. There's too many of them now. It's been <clears throat> almost 20 of them now since I've been talking I think about we can this. Put, I think signage is okay. It's not that yeah. difficult to do that. Yeah, I please. Think, Mayor, what I would like to do is that... Um, and this is not our road, obviously, all of you know that. And, and the design for Skinner trail, is, yeah. is way, right, and not our trail. And the, um, and the, you know, the design for Skinner is, is you know, that, that horse is running down the track. It's out of the gate, that said. Um, There's also in the this, overpass. Right, because in this situation, when you read that report, take 10 years to what's, what's really bothersome is that the car approached the, the crosswalk and stopped. The pedestrian was in the crosswalk with a flashing light. So the sun was a factor, most certainly in this incident, factor. but there are other incidents. We need to reach out to the entities in charge of that roadway and, and the trail and talk about signage and also to reinforce with a bicyclist that they need to stop at, the, at that area. Um, so, you know, there are lots of different things at work here, but I think that, that you know, first of all, you know, as the city of Dunedin, we need to, we need to approach as elected officials and staff work with them on the signage, 
I'm not sure how we can specifically address the sun because I did talk to uh, uh, North District Commander Joe Garretts yesterday. He watched the video. Um, he, he said that the sun was definitely an issue. You can see it on the windshield. So um, the, the, the young lady who was involved said she did not see the pedestrian at all. And so that's very, very alarming for all those who use it. I use it all the time as well. I jog you know, through there and I always wait for the eyes, but the problem is have the sun. when you can't see the eyes because of the sun, you know, so we need to address it. I am as concerned as you are and I hear you very clearly. Please put something up there as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. At least we tried to tell somebody. At mm -hmm. least we tried. Yeah. It's not going to, I'm not saying it's a panacea at all, mm -hmm. but let's put something up there because we, so, for how many years now we continue to talk? Mm -hmm. And the thing is still there. The, the only solution is to go under or over. I remember I went to the building with the bower that builds under the road, and I went to the people that build over the road. and. So that's the only solution to prevent this from happening here. But in the meanwhile, in the mean, but in the meanwhile, it's been almost 20 now. Well, and we have more incidents there than we do at Curler Road. Mm -hmm. I watched it just. That's crazy. It, just so the commission knows this, I stood at Skinner Road one time and Douglas, and was watching, and I watched a, a lady, doesn't matter. I watched a car, hit a guy on a bicycle, in the crosswalk. She looked at him, she looked away, he thought he saw her, so he started to go, and she went and hit him. I stand right there, standing right there. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that, that we better always be very, very careful, know we're in a dangerous intersection, and while well, we know that one's really, really dangerous. So let's just tell the people, watch them go through, just go, I'll go down there, just, if you don't, if you don't want to put a sign there, go down there and just watch the, the bicycles flying through there. They think the, the car's going to stop. The people walk because they think, they think, I was in California in 19, when I was stationed in California in 1971, you stepped off the road, every car stopped because if a car even looked like it was going to touch you, you they lost their license, okay? And so everybody was very afraid. I looked both ways, having been to Australia and having been to the United States, I looked both ways every time I cross the road, and then I'm expecting something to go wrong when I cross the road. Here, we got people crossing that thing from all parts of the world that some of them don't even know that it's, this gentleman probably did, Tom. I won't say his name, it doesn't matter. So he, he probably knew, but we have to, let's put a warning out there. Let, I'm sorry, I, I know I'm talking a lot, but I, really, I, we have to do this. We I think have we can do, do that. This. If I may, Commissioners, um, actually, uh, Joan Rice contacted us uh, early October. Um, she's working with Ford Pinellas. They actually mm -hmm. set some cameras out uh, between Cafe Racer and, and um, the hotel uh, to monitor the intersection. So they, they had those cameras set up for, I believe, a week or two weeks. So I think they're actively in the process of looking at what, what can possibly be done in that area. It actually happened to coincide about a month before this incident occurred, this most recent one. But the county is act actually looking at it. And, you know, to, to everyone's point, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, you know, we're in a unique situation here where the roadway's not ours, the trail's not ours. So we have to kind of rely on these other agencies as to what measures can be put in place. But we'll continue to work with them. I'm going to rely on my local government right now to put something there to tell these people, be careful. This is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I Enough. I think we can do that. Okay, can I just sure? Were you, were you saying you were you saying the red flashing lights? I w I wasn't saying one way or another. I was just saying some way of making people to stop. But that's been a big discussion. Too, I know whether the yellow, which is sort of cautious, or just red, just stop. Well, that's my point. We went the opposite way. We did a motion flashing thing that's like, oh, don't worry, it's going to go on automatically. So just keep on walking. Well, because they, that's what I think. I mean, I hear saying. you, except we had years and years love because we've only had this for what two years or something. Mm -hmm. Hasn't been that Three. long. We had years and years and years of accidents because nobody was pushing I, the buttons. I so this you. was, you know. I got you, but that may go back to and don't forget, attention, like Commissioner Doring was saying, Pinellas Trail in Dunedin is the number one consistently every month 
every year, number one highest usage of the trail in the entire county. Mm -hmm. It's Dunedin. Mm -hmm. Great for us. I mean, it's a great amenity, but, you know, and trust me, there are fights all over the county about getting those overpasses, <clears throat> you know, so. Well, I wonder if, you know, and Commissioner Tonga, I'm glad you brought it up today, but I just wonder if by next meeting we couldn't get some type of an update on what the thinking is mm -hmm. um, at that next level. I mean, I'm not, regardless of the warning issue, you know, what, what are the uh, powers that be who do own that piece of the trail thinking that we need to do? By your Thursday meeting or next work session? Next work session. <laughs> okay, that would, yeah, why I need a little have, bit more time. <laughs> you know what, why don't we ask uh, Wit to come? Mm -hmm to our work session mm. during the informational item and let's let's have a dialogue. I think that's the best thing to do because he's gonna be our bis biggest and best advocate. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we can, I think we should also invite um, District 7 Secretary, mm -hmm. which Witt can do. And whether it's the next meeting or the one after, you know, depending on his schedule, I think we get those two people in a room and get them on camera and get them where we're all talking. It doesn't mean you can't have conversations on your own, Jennifer. I don't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. But maybe Wit can bring some information, you know. But, I, I you know, it's kind of like how we've talked about having our law enforcement mm -hmm. yeah. work session, workshop or whatever. I think this is the same thing. You know, we're just done. We're done, we're spent, something has to happen, and, and it has to happen quickly, and y'all, we're putting you on notice right now. Well, in the short term then, Mayor, if, uh, if I may, we will work with the county as far as signage on the trail itself, yeah, yeah, because that would be the county, and then we can try to, ad to address this as far as long-term solutions go. With, yeah, and it with, I, I think it's Echo. important to have the, the sec district secretary mm -hmm. here. If I may, Mayor, yeah, yes, I'm sorry. Sir. Just as an avid bicyclist and a huge proponent of multimodal transportation, uh, I can't disagree with anything here, but the entire conversation has been on the pedestrians and the bicyclists and the trail as opposed to car drivers. And I think it's an equal responsibility. It goes back to uh, the most recent incident. The, the, the runner was in the crosswalk the lights were flashing, and this is actually just an unfortunate accident, and accidents happen. Uh, but I don't want to go, I, want, I don't want to put it out there that bicyclists and pedestrians are bad. They need to be warned, they need to be educated, when actually the education is across the board for everybody. And, and so we need to, in addition to the signage and things that we're talking about, we also need, across the entire county, educational PSAs that did just warn everybody about traffic and how to get along. I can't post anything pro-bicycle on the Facebook page without just getting bombarded with how rude and arrogant bicyclists are. And we have a lot of drivers, and I, I can't say there aren't bad actors out there on bicycles and pedestrians, but there's bad actors everywhere. And it just seems to me that we have been so car-centric for so long that there is just this entitlement among car drivers and anything bicyclists do, they're in the wrong. And so I don't, I don't want to lean toward anti-pedestrian, anti-bicyclists, where actually as a, as a community with the traffic and parking issues we have, that's the way we need to go. And so I don't, I don't want to give car drivers any opportunity to say bicycling is bad, is, is my only concern. I don't disagree with you at all. I see it all the time. <clears throat> you look at any of the Dunedin groups on Facebook, and as soon as you, every time that you talk about the trail with anything, it is throwing the bicyclists under the bus completely. And, you know, I mean, the whole purpose of the trail was to give them their own place to, to do both, you know, walk, run, bike, uh, and I have been long asking WIT, which the board approved and it still hasn't happened, for consistent crossings at the trail countywide. It's just like having consistent 
um, school uh, zones, you know, consistent um, miles per hour, because all over the county at one time they were all different. And so can't make that happen because nobody wants it to happen. Not in my city. I don't want you to have to stop. I mean, it's, there's a lot of different things going on, but I don't disagree with everything you just said. Okay, Jennifer. Thank you. I have thank you. And thank you, Commissioner, for bringing it up. Yeah, and, and again, again. Signage. Please, this is not the first time we've discussed this amongst everybody, and then it always comes back to it's not ours, and I understand. All, put, a sign, put a sign up there and tell the people that you are entering the most dangerous intersection in the United States of America. Only just say dangerous intersection, or whatever you want to say. But get something, let's get something up there, and it just makes me think that, whoa, I need to be careful. If you didn't, if you were in a country where they drive on the other side of the road and somebody doesn't tell you to look both ways, and you came from a country where you drive on the opposite side of the road, you'll look the wrong way every time. Well, let me tell you, when you cross a road, look both ways every time, always. So it's just education. I just don't want you to get hurt. That's all. Can we, if, if we, if, let, can we pl please put a sock, please I, do I something? I think she said yes. Yeah. Yes. She said yes. Thank you. We're good. Awesome. Thank Any you. other commission discussion items? Um, <clears throat> well, I, first of all, I was on my uh, Mies Morton plant meeting this morning. I'm on the clinical excellence committee, and um, I can't say numbers because we're not supposed to do that, but the news on the COVID in the, in the system is, is really good. I mean, they're way down and uh, especially in any kind of critical situations, way down. Um, and actually, that meeting has been, me that meeting has met virtually for, I don't know, like a year, year and a half, and we're gonna have our first in-person meeting next time. So that says something about the hospital system, um, which says something about where we are as a community with COVID, which is good news, not to let our guard down, but you know, yeah. it's good news. Um, Jennifer, on that note too, I was just wondering, like in terms of our, our staff and customer service and people being back in the offices, where, where are we at with that? Is everybody back in the offices now? Do we still have hybrids going on or what, what is? There's still some hybrid going on in those areas where they don't have uh, space and that would be in human resources and finance uh, and some in community development where they're still stipping, uh, sitting one on top of the other. I did um, ask that we put an, an item on the next department head meeting, which is tomorrow to discuss the full uh, back to work and full reopening um, of, of all departments in the city as well. So we, we are working on that. Cool, very good. Um, the only other thing I was just gonna update the commission just briefly is, um, I think uh, Jorge, we've had a couple of meetings with Duke Energy and we have another one next week. Uh, they wor are working on a report as we've uh, beat them up on. We don't want a dog and pony show. We want, you know, specific to our issues and um, so they've been doing a draft and working through with that. At the point after next week's meeting, probably we'll get something on the agenda for them to do a presentation to the entire commission. So, and uh, again, it's uh, kind of more Dunedin specific. So hopefully it will provide us with information that will be helpful as we move forward. And, uh, and then obviously the commission can tack on any of their concerns at the same time. So um, just wanted to give an update. 16th, okay, the week after, so um, that's it. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Anybody else commission discussion items? I do. Okay. Um, the golf club. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was just, I, I wanted to bring it up and talk to you all about it and then perhaps turn this way in a second. But um, I just want to make sure that we're getting um, really good solid input on the golf club from the residents of the city, um, that they understand what's happening. I know we are all so close to it, that, and certainly staff would be so close to it, they'd say, what do you mean? <laughs> so we're talking about all the time. Um, but just that they have input, just to make sure that they have input as to, as to what's, what some of the options are and what some of the things that we're working on. So I thought maybe also just get an update from you to see sure. where we are. Sure, absolutely. So the uh, uh, board of directors of, of the golf club have have reviewed the um, the sustainability study, um, staff's recommendations. I believe number four, which is the hybrid, 
Um, that has also been scheduled for the uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Committee and the Board of Finance. I don't have the dates uh, for you at this point. And for the City Commission at your work session on November 30th, I believe it is. Um, is it a workshop item, or an informational item? It is a workshop item, yes. Okay. Yeah, we're so not we'll looking be for voting, voting at a, We'll hear all of that and then be voting separately. Right, and we, yes. Okay. The uh, sustainability study itself, I need to double check and see if it's on the website. It should be, and we'll be more than happy to put it on the website and, and seek uh, public input. Certainly the public will see it on your agenda at a work session, and certainly it will be made available to um, the public, you know, when we when we advertise those, the Board of Finance meeting and the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee meeting as well. Okay. Yeah, I, would, I would like to, I really would like to make sure that before we get into anybody voting on anything, mm -hmm. um, because obviously you'll vote when you're asked to vote, um, but that but that they also perhaps some have some ca capacity or some capability of of getting input from from how those other folks think. And and when we rec get a recommendation from the Board of Finance, it's not whether they like golf or not, it's whether the financials are there. And the Parks and Rec are whether they think that now that's get, that gets broader and it would seem to me like they would have to have some kind of an input right. and understanding of uh, perhaps even of golf itself, but golf and, and, and how golf really relates to our community here. Yeah, and the Board of Finance has seen it already. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's coming back to the Board of Finance again, so. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and I think also, I think it's important. I know it's a different situation, but I, I, just as a reminder, the actual sustainability report included surveying of the public and what their feelings were about the golf club and yes. all of that. Now, mm -hmm. it doesn't talk about all the different plans. It just talks about you know, all of that. So they were, the public was extensively surveyed in that way. But I, I just think, you know, making sure that we do enough public notice and, um. Sure. Was the public actually, I thought it was just users of the golf club. No. Not I, I the thought, whole general public. But maybe I'm mistaken. I thought it was the general public. I, I, I thought, it, I thought it was just some of the people that were using it the actually club. Used it. That's what I thought. And, and they, and they said this members, is, non -members they didn't members. say it this way, but I think they said something like, this is certainly not statistical and this is certainly not to the depth that we would go, but here's just some indication from some of these folks, mm -hmm. which the minute you hear that, you always have to, you always have to be careful when you read that. Mm -hmm. That's my input re re recollection. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, city clerk update, Rebecca. Thank you, Mayor. Just one quick thing. Um, back at the August 17th um, work session, I did mention bringing the resolution 1606 to the first meeting in December when we talk about some of the other procedures and, and different things for the yearly meeting. But I'm, I'm requesting that we actually move that to the December 16th um, uh, work session as a workshop item, there is an opening there because I feel like it's more of a discussion item and we can get, dive a little deeper than it being an action item. So I just wanted to get consensus that that, that was okay with everyone um, because it's not, um, per the charter, it's not required. It was just something that I wanted to bring forward at that first meeting in December. So um, the 16th was the first open workshop that I thought we can um, discuss it a little further. Sounds good to me. Would that also be a time that we can talk about the length of our minutes and whether we need to think about not needing to have verbatim minutes anymore that, you know, the world has this changed? Isn't, this is board and committees. Okay. This is not, this is not, so when would you, our, ours will be the rules when we do our rules and procedures. Okay, so that would be in just in December yeah, as well. Resolution 20-40 actually gotcha. is the um, Commission's rules and procedures, and that is on the um, first meeting of December agenda. So I'll make a note yeah. to um, make sure. I just want to make sure it. we covered that. We brought it up. We were going to talk about it, but I wasn't. Yeah, gotcha. Because one of the other things that we can talk about, which goes to the calendar, kind of what Jennifer had mentioned earlier, because in the re resolution 20-40, it does state when I should be scheduling. Um, for that calendar. So when if we have some consensus, then we can maybe adjust that too. adjust that as well. Sure. Everybody else okay with that? Okay. Anything else? That was it, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, city manager update. I had a lovely vacation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for giving me the time. 
and that's okay. my update. <laughs> and she missed us. Yes, I did immensely. Nikki, any updates? I, I have one um, update from a report from the report that I gave to the commission um, a couple weeks ago. Um, since we have a few minutes, mm -hmm. the um, the commission you may recall when we were doing our annual report, um, we also reported we were hopeful that the ORC would be coming back to your November um, second work session in November. Um, there they are. I just wanted to give a brief update on some of their efforts because as you noticed, it's not on your agenda for next week, but that's not because they haven't continued to do their good work. In fact, they're largely um, down to a final draft report that is just needing a final vote. The um, last month and the month before that, the committee did not have a full member, uh, a 100% participation. So in, in fairness to all of the work that they have all put in since 2018, the chair wanted to provide an opportunity for um, all of the members to be at a meeting to vote on the final report. Now the clerk's office is still working out whether that will be able to happen between November and December. And if it's not, then the final report may just have to come from a, from a quorum. And, and, and all of the mem committee members have still been provided with the report and are aware, are aware too of the various um, avenues for them to be able to attend if they do desire to have 100% attendance. But I'm bringing that up to let you know, so um, obviously as an update into when you will receive the ORC report, which at the latest date would still be in January, which is before your deadline that you gave to the ORC of February of 2022. Um, but that also kind of raises a, a, an additional question that I just wanted to bring up to the commission for you all to think about, and this is not to put anybody on the spot tonight or today or anything like that, but Obviously, with the with ORC now going into 2022, um, potentially by giving give, they're going to give you your final report in 2022. You technically right now have under um, you have two committees under under your charter that meet to advise you on these issues, as you're aware of. You have the Ordinance Review Committee, which is just about to complete its work, and you have the Charter Review Committee, which completed its work in 2017, late 2017. Um, under the charter, those are both appointed every five years. So part of what I'm bringing to you is we're coming to the time of that five years of charter review committee. ORC still isn't done and may not be done until 2022. Um, and it, that's a, this is a tight window that you all are operating in. And these are, these are, um, additional services that are provided, not just by my firm. I mean, it's just, this is, it's an in-depth process, as you can see, both from the, the length of time, you know, that, and I know there were a few other things in the OR, this is not on the <coughs> ORC, there were a few things that, that affected their work with the hiring of the new community development director and things like that. So it's not that they took too much time, it's just these processes take time. And so I don't know if the city has ever historically been in this, position where you have both of them running and appointed at the same time and are overlapping and are kind of, and, and so it just, I wanted to bring it up to the commission to see if there is, if that, if, if that's the route we want to continue to, to operate in, then we'll bring back a recommendation, you know, a recommendation for you to begin appointing the charter review committee and we'll begin that process now. Um, we are coming into the time period when Rebecca got notice that there uh, of, for the ability to do an election next year, if instead the commission wanted to consider staggering the ORC and CRC um, timeframes or, um, or something of that nature. But again, that is a larger discussion. I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot tonight. It's just these timeframes are now overlapping and, and, and they seem to be kind of, based on, you know, and, and now with ORC reviewing both the code and the land development code, I mean, that's a tight time frame to be reappointing every five years. And so I'm just kind of bringing it up as an observation. This is a charter thing, so this would be a referendum issue. So it's just something to think about. Um, and I, and I want to just bring it up because especially, you know, when now we were, we were trying to get ORC done early, at least so we would be done in 2021, but now we're going to be going to 2022. So we'll, want, so we'll be appointing a, an ORC in 2022, and then, and then again, or they'll be done in 2022, and we'll be appointing a new one in 2023. 
So it's, it, these are really tight time frames to have completed a pro process and then be pretty much initiating and it's a, lot of a work new on, one. It's a lot of work on the team. Well, and I, and, and I was going to say, I mean, I can't speak to the, to the burden or to, you know, to the resources that staff invests into these processes, but I know that they are extensive. I know that they are thoughtful and prepared for each of these processes and they're, and they're extensive. So um, I just want to be, you know, before we just come and bring before you, okay, time to do another CRC. I just wanted to point out this observation because it seems like it's, um, it's, it's pretty onerous um, to be completing both processes on the same time frame in the same schedule. And with an election coming up. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, I, I do think it's worthwhile looking at time frames and ensuring that they are staggered. I, I know that the last couple of years they've been pretty tight together. Um, and I, I think we should look at and for your, I was going to, I failed to mention too, the volunteers too, your volunteer boards are the ones that invest the most time into this. And so if you can imagine, you know, investing four years of your life and then the next year, all oh, someone, you know, like it, it's like the, all that work and then it's good for one year and then we're just going to go and do it all over again. It kind of, you know, the, the hard work that the volunteers have put into, I wanted to comment on that because they're really the, the boards that are paying really, really close attention to this and you don't want them to feel like, well, what does it matter? Someone's going to come in tomorrow and just do something different <clears throat> or, you know, or, or, or something. I think it would be worthwhile to understand uh, what's happening into other cities around us and all of that as far as time frames, you know, like if it, is it every five years? Is it every 10 years? You know, um, I mean, I know 10 years is common as well. Um, yeah, I asked around at FMAA last year, because that's the, or over the summer, just to kind of try to get a gauge. Um, there was actually a charter review um, presentation at that CLE. And so I just was trying to do some empirical digging and I wasn't able to find anything concrete, but I think you're, I mean, you're absolutely right, Mayor, there's an overwhelming majority that either had, you know, if they had an ORC and CRC, they were staggered or they did them every 10 years or allowed for certain gaps um, of preparation time in between. Um, the, the, the only, I mean, some of the prevailing guidance was that there is absolutely no way to get these done in like two year cycles. But, you know, so, so five wasn't out of the question. It, it's a little bit unique too, though, because you're stagger, you're, you also have an ORC, which not every community has. Um, that's another- Not you know, a lot of people do have the ORC, do they? Um, no, it's it's more rare than a CRC. I would say most charters have a charter review yeah. fun, f um, committee function. Um, I, I mean, I know Largo's is ten years. I think I, some are just upon you know upon request from the commission. So if the commission feels like it's time to do a review, they can initiate a review. But there's not a time period, and it really runs the gauntlet. I mean, it's your charter, it's your constitution. So that's the other thing too is it has to be what the citizens want. But that's also why I want to just bring up the question for the commission for you all to think about and to consider or vet because, you know, you do have some great volunteers who have now put in four years of their life on ORC and are now, you know, and we're going to go, okay, great, thanks for the report in 2022. Now let's appoint your replacements six months well, later. We, we just had our charter in 2020. We just, we just received the report from the 2016 committee in 2020. Correct. Yes. So you would be yeah. appointing in 2021, yeah. technically, even though you just got the revol results of your charter review in 2020. So, I, you know, I, I'm not, that's not a legal concern necessarily how someone feels, but I understand, but, but, but in your, but when you have a volunteer board that's just put in from 2016 to 2020 to give you a report that's current and that you're considering to go and have to replace a, you know, do a new, start a new process, the ne very, you know, six months yeah. from then is, is, you know. So would it be okay for everybody if, challenging. if, if uh, um, Nikki maybe provided us, Nikki can work with Rebecca, maybe, maybe provide us some with some data mm -hmm. um, and maybe even some thoughts on what could solve it and make it a little bit, make it flow a little bit better. And maybe it's an informational item, a workshop item for us to have a dialogue about. I mean, it doesn't mean we're going to do anything with it. I, it just means 
Yeah, no, I think that's a, I would is that love okay with everybody? to be able to have that. Uh, if, if, you know, if you're interested, again, this is, I know this is new and, and we were hoping just to try to kind of front load everything and stick within time frames that are under the charter, but it is, you know, I think you all can see it's, it's been, um, it's a little tight. So yeah, we'll look at that. I'll work with Rebecca. We'll put together some data and then you all can, can continue to further consider it. Cause like you mentioned, Mayor, it may just be an, a, an ability to say, well, the appointment can be from when you last received the, inf yeah, the information I mean, in current it report. That. I mean, we're not saying we're going to change it or not change it, but at least right. we can look at it and have a dialogue, right. an educated dialogue. And any, cha and any change, again, would be a change where you have a reference. It's not, this is not a yeah, totally a city commission it. decision because it's a charter question, but it's one that, you know, is important that, um, that you all consider, I think. It's our own charter review. Well, there you go. It's your own, yes, it's your, your own, and, and those those happen too, so. Yeah, okay. You can be on the committee. All right, oh I think you got the direction you needed. Thank you, All right, yes. Thank you. We'll go ahead and get that scheduled for a um, future one after Rebecca and I are able to get together. Okie doke. Okay, uh, final commission comments on liaison things and all of that, Vice Mayor. Anything you want to report? Uh, nothing to report other than the high school is putting on Elf the Musical December 2nd through the 4th. Oh, that's, that's cool. cool. What is this? Nice. Um, December 4th? December 2nd through the 4th. Oh, okay. Do they have matinees too? Uh, they are going to have a Saturday matinee, which is the 4th. Oh, that'd be very cool. My kids would like that. Yeah, for sure. Is it? No, I mean, um, the only thing is, obviously, um, there's a couple Blue Jay things. Um, that we're looking at in terms of we have to we have a deadline on when to pick our games for you know that we're going to be at for the suite next year and then you know the trip and uh, so uh, and the welcome back event let's not forget that yeah so uh, yeah so I'll uh, I'll give you a, a good update uh, in the next two weeks to to see where we're at with all that um, I had one question about next time's agenda the, the legislative it'll be our legislative priorities that we're talking about right we're not going to be looking at what they did last year. Because didn't we have we, a couple of legislative ones that we were going to do a little deeper dive of the effects on staff? Was I my We did. Yeah, there were some of those, and, and we will consider those. So we're starting to form your legislative platform, uh -huh. and we'll bring the Florida League of Cities and whatever they have and the counties uh, forward as well and just start to form that. It's a workshop item. I think her question, too, is that this is setting priorities for the upcoming session. The legislative memos and the any changes that are needed out of the memos that came out of last session we have our also continued to meet with the different department heads that are affecting it. There are two or three ordinances or changes that we have sent to the community development department or to public works or fire to review. So we've, we've continued to work on those, um, implementing changes and, um, but I'm not sure, I don't want to speak for Jennifer, her staff, well, and where they are with some of the... Well, that was my question. I thought we were going to have some follow-up on some of those key things. Would you be ready to do that? Sure, we can give you an update on where yeah. we are. I mean, it would be helpful to know impacts of prior legislation as we look at what we're looking at. We can let you know where we are in the process. That would be great. Jennifer, if you, um, if you need anything from that spreadsheet, just get with me, and we can okay. make sure we coordinate on that. Okay. 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 I, I think that's all I have. Okay. Commissioner Kynes, anything? Um, yes, I, you know, I, I did talk to Jennifer about this and I was just um, going to ask that she give us an update on the uh, character overlay. 110 people showed up. Yeah. It was great. Didn't you think it was great? I mean, I know you were right. Commissioner Torngan. I mean, people are really fired up. So we'd really like to know, you know, have a game plan of where we're going to go. Um, there were some really interesting questions asked that I think uh, Kimley Horn with staff might have to sort of grapple with. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to thank the staff. I thought uh, George and Molly and Francis did a fabulous job right. in getting people yeah. out, and I wanted to thank them. Um, so you and I just spoke about this, and maybe when you – can get your staff together you can sort of direct us on next steps yeah and and i'm sorry i missed that meeting i heard that it was a very good meeting it was and fabulous. very well attended which is very very good to know oh. we're very happy about the attendance the uh, i do need to get with george and community development staff it, it is it is scheduled for 
or should go to LPA if, if we were to keep within the time frame that we need on the zoning in progress. I asked the commissioner for a little bit more time to sit down with staff and put together those, those milestone dates in moving forward with the overlay and to how we're gonna address some of those questions. I haven't had a chance to do that because I was spending my day with all of you yesterday. No, so absolutely, yeah. I, I understand. But um, then I also wanted to, um, I, I got to take my grandchildren to see the uh, Witches of Dunedin, mm -hmm. and then Lucy spent the rest of the day trying to figure out if she could do the witches dance. <laughs> so um, I, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you to them. They've raised about six thousand uh, dollars for the Kutsarias, uh Scholarship Fund under Parks and Rec, and so I think you know we all owe them a, a huge debt of gratitude. Um, then we're going to be having, and I know that the church is asking if you haven't let them know if you can be at the sin, I cannot say it, the centennial, whatever. That's centennial. <laughs> yes. Right. You know, if you're going to be able to attend, you know, please let them know at the church. And uh, they've got a whole big thing, uh, a lot planned. Um, the last hurrah is Saturday night. So I know the History Museum has been working very diligently uh, on uh, having a huge fundraiser for this beautiful mansion that at some point will not be there. Um, also, uh, I met with Jennifer and we had a great discussion on the digitization project and it is really moving along uh, with our partnership with uh, USF. We have a strong partnership with USF that does forensic um, digitalization. I mean, it's amazing. So we had a great meeting, made me feel really good. We're, we're moving. And um, I think that's all that I have to report. I'm not trying to, the DFAC, I know they've started some new classes. It's time if you want to sign up. And um, I think that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any liaison comments, Commissioner Torga? Yes, I do. Uh, so this is a, a chance for us to make, uh, make comments, correct? Mm -hmm. And some announcements. Um, I did want to make a, just a, a, a comment to staff regarding, regarding the overlay. Um, the most curious questions that, that I got that I received that I, that I thought were most noteworthy to tell you about is that there were several people that were very concerned about the length of time that this has been going through. So it's just input. Um, and then the second one was there were some people that were confused as to what was actually happening. Uh, what, were the, what were the outcomes? And, and so I think that would be good, good that we, we get that down so that we understand what some of those are as well. So when we're talking with the folks, we're, we understand at least some direction or some, some of the issues that, that might, might be beneficial to us. So um, November. November is a, a, a wild month. We just started it yesterday. We got our city manager back to work. <laughs> and, uh, and then we get cake today. So that, uh, that's Happy wonderful. And then, and then we start with November 10, the Marine Corps birthday. And then we have November 11, if I may just digress, just for a moment. This is very, very important stuff. Stormy Voyage Home, I'm reading from my American Legion magazine. This is just from the editor's note. In December 1920, American Legion founder, founding leader, Hamilton Fish of New York introduced legislation that would deliver the unknown soldier, soldier to Arlington National Cemetery less than a year later. The Legion was involved at every step of the journey from participation of the selection of the fallen hero through the tomb's dedication on November 11, 1921. The trip from France to the United States would be carried out on the USS Olympia, now dry docked, on display at the Independent Seaport Museum in Philadelphia, the last of the U.S. Spanish-American War fleet still in existence. This is a story of Olympia's harrowing trip across the Atlantic and how the unknown soldier was protected and delivered in the face of a historical storm. 
The story is absolutely incredible. A Marine Corps captain who later became a two-star general in World War II. Uh, his comment was he expected to perhaps even lose the body because of the storm there, it lose the ship too. But he said if the body went over, he was going over with it because he knew he didn't accomplish his job. 38 Marines were on this ship. Does anybody remember the date that we ended up with our brand new Hurricane Pass? Uh, October 25th, 1921. So you heard when this started off, and these guys were in that hurricane, that very same hurricane, and almost lost that by almost lost the Marines off that ship as well. Harrowing story, but incredible for the unknown soldier. This year they're allowing individuals to place flowers, etc., on the unknown soldier up in Washington D.C. Um, then it sort of continues with a couple of exciting opportunities for all of us. Um, we have uh, November 13. November 13 is down the Wine and Blues, um, Rock and Roll. We have November 20th, Celtic Festival. Um, also on November night 17, the Rotary North um, Club will be uh, celebrating the 50th year anniversary, 50 years meeting at our golf club. And remember, we're not too far away from 100 years at our golf club in 1927. So November, November also has one of the greatest events in the world, and that's called Thanksgiving. Starts for our entire history of the United States, actually, and uh, in Texas today where we, again, become very family-oriented and with the most important things of freedom in what we have uh, in this country. So November is always hot for me. Everybody have a great November. Just wanted to let you know just a little bit about that. Now, why am I wearing purple? Because November is Alzheimer Awareness Month. Okay, there's a separate day, but this month, and this is the focus, for example, on my Rotary Club um, for, for what we're doing with, with cash for this year and what we want to fund and what we want to continue to fund. But Five, more than five million people in the United States alone have this incredible dangerous, and it is a disease, and it's a, and it, and it is a, a disease that will kill you. And we always talk about the caretakers of the, of, the, of, the, of the veterans that survive, that have caretakers, and how many of them there are and how many are affected by those that are alive. And that goes also with those that have the Alzheimer's. So my purple is representing Alzheimer week. It's a combination of red, anybody know that? Combination of red and blue, but I'll, that's a whole other story. <laughs> there we go, November, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, I was gonna talk about the Celtic Festival, but you just stole my thunder there, Commissioner. <laughs> you can <do> um, it. <laughs> uh, So anyway, yep, we're back to those events. Uh, Art Harvest, I forgot that. Oh yeah, there you go. Art Harvest is this coming weekend, Saturday and Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. Um, with extra parking at the high school uh -huh. and trolley down there. Um, so yeah, we have a lot going on this month and next it's month. Opening back up. Yep. Um, but I also wanted to remind everybody that our American Recovery Act Town Hall meetings um, next week, Tuesday, November 9th from 9 to 11, right here in Commission Chambers for our business community. And then that same day from 6 to 8 at our library for our residents. And then Wednesday, November 17th from 2 to 4 at our library for our not-for-profit organizations. And this is a chance for you to come and hear what can be funded and give your opinion on what you would like to see funded based on what category you fall in. I have a question. Yes, um, I think we had a question come in about whether or not people could watch it, you know, you know, would be able to participate in some other way. I don't know that we want to do a hybrid, but if they could watch the presentation, if they can give input in some way, if they're not there, mm -hmm. uh, have, do we have plans for that? Or? We do, yes. We, we intend to do a, a, a Facebook Live, and they can send in their comments. Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Nice. Thank you. Okay. That is all I have. Anything else for the good of the order? All right. We are adjourned. Thank you.
Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin. Follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.